the case in question is Snyder versus Phelps. Uh, it involved the controversial Westboro Baptist Church and its practice of picketing the funerals of American soldiers uh, killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think this is, this is one of these cases, and you see this coming across in the Supreme Court's decision that was factually a gut-wrenching case for everybody involved, including me, including all of us in the First Amendment community. Factually a repulsive case, but legally, quite frankly, a pretty easy case on the legal principle. I mean, once you get over the threshold that this was speech addressing itself primarily to matters of public concern, uh, to military policy, to gay rights, uh, to moral and religious issues. Once you get over the threshold that it's speech as to a matter of public concern, then to hold otherwise, to hold in favor of the Snyder family, really would have been to say that there are some ways to express yourself on a matter of public concern that are just so terrible that you can't ever say them anywhere on the face of the earth because this was speech that was far enough removed from the funeral that it didn't actually disrupt the conduct of the funeral at all. That would have been quite a different case. But the fact, the dispositive fact was that the uh, Snyder family didn't learn about this until seeing the speech afterward on the internet. And so uh, since there's nowhere that you could engage in speech that you can't be sure that someone will see it on, won't see it on the internet, right? There's nowhere that you can engage in speech to be sure that it won't be seen on the evening news afterward by somebody. It really would have been a ruling saying, you just can't say this anytime, any place on the face of the earth. And I think that that would have been an untenable proposition under the First Amendment. So I think doctrinally it was rightly decided, no matter how terrible of a taste it leaves in all of our mouths factually. From the perspective of someone who knows a lot of First Amendment cases from a non-lawyer's perspective, I think you know, Fire wrote a, a brief on the Phelps' side for pretty much the same reason that Frank brought up. Um, one of the interesting things that made it a co more complicated decision from the beginning was that way back at the beginning, uh, one of the signs said, God hates you. And so the trial judge basically said, well, that could have been against the Snyder family, and so we're going to let the jury decide that. And so if they really meant you, the Snyders, without even like making a distinction between the person who had died and the rest of the family, uh, maybe there is enough there for kind of a personal attack that the jury would get to decide instead of, as a matter of law, saying it was just protected. But by the time we made it to the Supreme Court, that had already kind of fallen out as a, as a question. I'm going to fill two chairs, so I'd like to reserve a couple of minutes, just maybe a minute or two after I, I finish uh, the task of really, uh, in effect, representing the Phelps family, which isn't represented here. Um, and I say that represented in terms of just give, telling you about an interview I did with Margie Phelps a, a little over two weeks ago at the College Media Advisors. And I asked her some of the questions that I think have been posed here and that were, came, came up in the Supreme Court. And basically, are there funerals that you wouldn't go to, where won't you go, and why did you win? And where do you think it's going from here? Uh, I will tell you that they think they won because the uh, even though America is doomed, which is their message, uh, they think that uh, they are not there to inflict emotional distress on the subject uh, of their protest, if you will. Uh, they see their message of salvation uh, as they did to, uh, uh, they saw the Snyder case, telling the Snyder family, in effect, where they have gone wrong and where they might redeem themselves by uh, presumably the Snyder family repudiating their past conduct, uh, if you will. Uh, they see themselves as uh, uh, bringing a public message on public property uh, according to law. They're very careful. Uh, they called ahead. They actually obeyed a Maryland law uh, that was not yet in effect about public protest. They see themselves uh, as, as she put it, uh, 50 people against 310 million. And they think that's exactly what the First Amendment ought to protect. And they think that's why they won in the Supreme Court. We're seeing a Supreme Court that has moved the issue of private and public person toward a, a consideration now of public issue so that you might engage private citizens in a way they might have been sheltered from before. But as long as you are discussing a public issue or an issue of public interest or concern, They've, they've moved the attention. The, the original, I think, intent of that lawsuit was to argue Mr. Snyder was a private individual. 
and therefore some of the things that a public figure would have to endure, uh, he did not have to endure. Well, the court really shifted in their decision off to this issue of when I decide, as opposed to the person who might be impacted, when I decide to speak, if it's on a matter of public interest, I, I drag First Amendment protection along with me. Uh, and I also think we're going to see the next round of lawsuits be on the time, place, and manner restrictions on 100 feet, 500 feet, 2,500 feet, an hour before and after the funeral, two hours or three hours, uh, in direct line of sight or not direct line of sight. Uh, but again, the Phelps family is very good at conf consulting with local p officials and uh, making sure that they're obeying like, ordinances and, and obeying the instructions of police. In fact, there are some people who allege that they support their public protests by, in effect, uh, engineering settlements uh, with people who unfairly restrict their rights to protest, and then they reach a settlement out of court, and that's how they fund the next round of public protests. I wasn't able to get anything from her confirming or denying that, but they have had settlements uh, because people have reacted emotionally, restricted or prevented them from speaking, and they have won in either, either in court or uh, uh, more likely in out-of-court settlements. So let's say someone is telling everyone you're all sinners, um, and then someone says, what about me? And uh, yeah, you too. Well, now I've gone from kind of a public statement about kind of matter of public concern that the United States is a bunch of sinners to, well, you are too. So there's the whole, and then, well, you're part of that whole, and so you're that private individual. And so I think that's kind of what's going on with the picketing of military funerals too. It, it's not that it was Snyder in particular, it was here's just another example of what we do, but then Snyder also took it personally because it was true, it was his own son. So I, I, I bring that up as a question of public versus private. It was interesting. Uh, I asked her, was there a place where she wouldn't go, where the family wouldn't go? And they said, a private, a truly private funeral. So the journalist in me said, what is a truly private funeral to you? And it turns out that a funeral, even which you might have a one-line listing of an obituary, ceases to become a truly private service to them. That is precisely the argument that, that they made, was that this was a personal attack, and you're trying to immunize a, a hurtful personal attack by dressing it up as sort of a public issue, and it's really not. And what the Supreme Court said, to determine whether it's public or private speech, you need to look at the form, the content, and the context. All of those factors go into whether it's public or not. And looking at those, those factors, they said there was no pre-existing relationship between uh, the Phelps and, and the Snyder, so it wasn't like this was a feud that they had engaged in any kind of communication before. And the, the church had a 20-year history prior to this funeral of picketing military funerals. So it was pretty clear that they didn't target the, the, uh, the, the Snyders in, you know, uh, themselves. It was part of their pattern and practice of getting their public message out in, in, a, in a hateful, uh, hurtful way. Uh, but that's the that's what the First Amendment is there to protect is that that type of uncomfortable uh, speech that can be can be hurtful uh, can be uh, very painful uh, as in this case. I mean, we don't need the First Amendment to protect the speech that we all like. <laughs> it's for this type of speech, and that's this is a similar case on the facts to Texas versus Johnson, the flag burning case. Uh, which really brings out strong emotions. In fact, I think Justice Stevens dissented in that case, uh, who traditionally a very strong uh, supporter of the First Amendment. So these types of cases bring out passions in people, but the fact that it was decided eight to one, uh, you know, tells you that these, uh, this type of issue, the First Amendment, really transcends conservative and uh, liberal judicial philosophies that that uh, and that gives me a lot of hope for this court that this is a court that recognizes the the importance of the First Amendment and is willing to stand up for it in a in a really tough case. As I understand it, part of the grounds for this suit was invasion of privacy, and here you have a situation where this is a private funeral, private people are attending it, but this outside group comes in, picks up this private family essentially and injects them against their will into a public issue that they want no part of. Uh, is that right? 